I'm Thorne Dickinson. This show allows me to talk with Mainers working on the most important clean energy project to ever come to our state. We discuss how this project is providing jobs and other benefits today while creating clean energy for a better tomorrow. Well, Jerry, thank you very much for doing this. I think we've been working for uh, more than four years together on this project and uh, maybe start off with just a little bit about your background. Oh, sure. Uh, so I've been at Central Maine Power since 1989, done a variety of uh, things, m all in the environmental and regulatory and legislative field. Um, and then in early 2017, started working on this project with and for you and others. And so um, what got you interested in that area of work, environmental? What was, uh, was that something in your background, something that interested you? or? Yeah, I had this idea that, um, you know, there might be a way to uh, actually get paid to do what I loved, which is kind of a unique notion, but I think it's everyone's dream. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science in Ecology and an MBA, but uh, when I studied ecology, which is like field biology, it's how organisms interact with their environment, I was really interested in just understanding how things work. I wanted to be able to look at a tree and say, okay, I know what that is. It's a white pine or it's a blue spruce. And, uh, and then just segue that into work that actually utilize that knowledge and those skills and including this project. Uh, one of the other things that I thought was really fascinating is I felt really proud of the original project we, we laid out, uh, the route of it, the, the way that we used certain design in order to minimize impacts. But through the permitting process and in listening to what people in the public said about the projects, we did make changes. I'm curious like what things stood out for you or how you saw that process of of modifying the project. So, you know, there are a few really big items that wound up in the final approvals. You know, one of them is uh, conservation of 40,000 acres, which is, in, in my no to my knowledge, unprecedented in Maine for any project. Um, and that was really about preservation of valuable habitat, uh, connectivity of habitat in that area, tapering of vegetation, which was done for both habitat connectivity purposes and for uh, visual purposes, where this is something that's been done only on one project in Maine with, with limited success because it was done differently. But in this case, the DEP is telling us, you know, what we want you to do is to retain as much vegetation as possible so that um, animals that are attempting to cross from point A to point B um, have less of an exposed area to cross. Um, and just in terms of the, uh, we've, we've done things with culverts where we're replacing culverts to connect fisheries habitat. Um, that is right now disconnected because some of the culverts are n not operational or they're missing. Um, we've expanded buffers around streams uh, extensively. We have very stringent erosion controls for structures that are anywhere near water within buffers of uh, water bodies. So there are some things that have been done on this project. Oh, and then, of course, not using herbicides in segment one, which is a really big uh, change from any project that we've been involved in in the past. I think that to be honest, a lot of the innovations on this project will become the new standard for projects going forward. And, you know, we are the, the guinea pigs, but we're also the leaders. We went under the Kennebec River. We also had full canopy height in certain areas where we're highlighted by some of the opposition that said, we want to make sure these areas are protected. So uh, there's so much about uh, the changes that were made that I think in the end that we feel proud about. And I, I go back to that, that 40,000 acres. I, I think we're impacting just over 1,000 acres. Is yeah. that yeah. about right? And you know, so that ratio of 1,000 impa acres impacted versus 40,000 in conservation, I think anybody that's interested in protecting that Maine woods uh, can, can look to that as, as some kind of an additional benefit. And then uh, I, I always liked ultimately what the DEP talked about, which is for people that really care about the Northern Maine woods, the largest uh, danger is actually climate change. On the current trajectory without reductions, Northern New England, you know, where we are, is going to look a lot like Southern New England in not too long a time, which would not just change the tree cover, but it, it would affect fisheries and every, every wildlife component that we value. And so it really is uh, part of the answer to that concern, that broad concern about climate change. We have a couple more hurdles in our way to get to the end, and one of them is the referendum. For me, uh, I understand the, the right of people to vote on laws, but the strange thing to me is to go through this incredibly thorough process that somehow almost seems to be left behind, particularly when you have referendum language that is retroactive. You know, it's going back. So that has impacts on 
kind of respecting in my mind the permitting process we've been through, but also the rights of people that are interested in developing projects and main and future investments. I mean, I don't know your thought on it from where you sat throughout the, the whole process. Well, I think if you apply some of the um, opposition to this project to any other project where a, uh, a, an applicant conceives of a project, energy, infrastructure, or other, and, and you know, attempts to meet all the requirements for approval and goodwill and understands that you know, they're gonna have to make certain concessions along the way, but ultimately does meet all those approval criteria, and then someone comes along because they don't like it for whatever reason, you know, legitimate or illegitimate, uh, and, and attempts to sort of override those rules. You know, I, I have a problem with that, obviously, because we've been up against that. Um, and I think that you know, another proof of concept here is that ultimately, people, developers of energy infrastructure projects or other projects, if we succeed, will have some confidence that, yes, in fact, even with opposition, if you do the right thing and, um, you know, meet the approval criteria, a project can succeed. We were talking a little bit about your background and kind of what the motivation was for you to get into this area and all the accomplishments that uh, you've been able to achieve in getting all the permits that we have. Um, but then just like a personal perspective, looking at this project, thinking about the benefits it provides, what it means for climate change, what it means for Maine. Maybe just talk a little bit about how you personally feel about it. Now, where I see this project fitting into the overall is that it's, a, it's an incremental improvement. It's a very important improvement. It's one of the first uh, in terms of replacing fossil fuel generation and the emission reductions that are part of that with renewably generated electricity. It's a really critical project, not just for what it contributes of its own, but the precedent is establishing that there can be successfully conceived, designed, constructed projects that have an environmental benefit in terms of climate change. And I think it, it actually carries a lot more weight than just this project because of that, because it's, a, it's almost a proof of concept project. Even in the face of a lot of opposition that's well-funded and you know, dedicated, motivated, and yet, Ultimately, you know, we're, we're on a successful path here and we feel good about it because we believe, I believe, that this project is the right project.